I, I saw the original Exorcist as a child. It traumatized me for weeks. Um, when, when I heard that they were turning The Exorcist into, into a TV show and they were looking for a writer, um, I said, that's a terrible idea. Please don't do that. You're never going to, uh, you're never going to tell that story better. You're only going to tell it longer. Um, but I went into the rights holders and I kind of p aggressively pitched, if you guys don't want to tell the same story about Reagan and, and Father Marin and Father Karras, if you want to tell a brand new story with a brand new group of characters that takes place in the same universe, uh, but 40 years later. So you're not writing the original film out of existence. You're not saying this story never took place. You're just exploring what is possession, what does demonic possession look like in 2016? What does an exorcism look like after seeing exorcisms in pop culture for 40 years? Um, what is it like following an American family uh, over the course of 10 hours and watching that family fall apart when they're attacked by this supernatural force as opposed to kind of trying to cram all that into 90 minutes? Um, those were kind of the things that appealed to me uh, and, and, and really drew me to the project. And, and that's kind of been our guiding philosophy going forward is, is to just tell something that's respectful of what came before, but but try to blaze our own trail, try to create something new that kind of stands on its own two feet instead of just a sort of parade of homages and, and, and tipping the hat to the original. Uh, first of all, uh, The Exorcist will be the new version of the original in 1971. Then what changed and it became a TV series? Well, we, we had um, the rights holders, Morgan Creek, had the rights to to William Peter Blatty's novel, The Exorcist. And, and they wanted to, the original plan, I think, before I came on board with, with a different uh, a different showrunner, uh, the original plan was to kind of tell the same story. Um, and, and I basically pitched them, uh, this is three years ago, so Fargo didn't exist uh, at the time, but I basically pitched them the, the horror version of Fargo where it's, it, it takes place in the same universe as the movie you, you know and love, and it has the same basic tone, and we're tackling the same themes of faith and spirituality and, and good versus evil. Um, so hopefully if you like the original film, that you will, thank you, you will also like the television show. You, you will say, it, it will feel familiar to you, but at the same time, it's, it's not a story where you already know the ending of it. You, this is a brand new story with a brand new cast of characters. And, and, and so that's a huge part of the appeal is we don't have to kind of follow in the footsteps and kind of stick to a script that everyone in America already knows the ending of that particular story. Um, it gives us the chance to really surprise audiences and, and do something fresh and new. What's interesting is having the two priests, which the first movie did so well, but the biggest difference is Father Marcus is the exact opposite of Marin. He's yes. an accomplished. He's he's kind of uh, he's kind of a man without a country in a lot of ways. And then Father Tomas is a total innocent. Yeah. Uh, and is, but he's trying to find what his calling is. Uh, talk about kind of developing those two characters and to make the mistake, and, and kudos for making him a Latino, by the way. Which is oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we knew that we wanted two priests, obviously, uh, a young and an old, but it, it didn't appeal, there was no appeal in, in kind of using the exact same archetype, so we had to look for new ways we can kind of spin these characters. And also just what, what appeals, what's appealing about this character where you could tell stories about him, not just for 10 episodes in this first season, but maybe for six or seven seasons if the show was a hit. like. What makes this someone you would want to follow on a journey? And so the idea of, of, of creating a father, Marcus, who's sort of a James Bond figure, he's very much a man without a country, a bit of a soldier of fortune, someone who has, um, the Catholic Church has turned their back on him in a way. He is, he is kind of their dirty little secret that they would prefer to forget. And he's kind of gone rogue a little bit and is, is, is living off the grid and con continuing this fight. And then contrasting that with someone like Tomas, who is, you know, Tomas is, is basically your perfect priest where he's compassionate and he's a lovely, he, he's someone you would trust with your deepest, darkest secret. And all he wants to do is help uh, the people around him. But at the same time, he is dangerously naive. He doesn't believe in these things. He has, if you come to him and start talking about demonic possession, he's going to explain, you know, the concept of demons are metaphors. These, these aren't actual, physical, tangible beings to be afraid of. And, and Obviously, Tomas is, is learning very quickly that he was wrong about the world, and so he can really serve as our, as our entry point for the audience. He can be our eyes and ears as we're kind of introduced to this larger world. Yeah, it's awesome. Good casting. When it comes to uh, the seasonal structure for The Exorcist, uh, are you guys 
planning on concentrating on Durant's family for the first season, or are you planning on breaking it up as you go along? No, no. The, the um, my original pitch was that every season is going to be a self-contained story from beginning to end. It's it's not an anthology show like American Horror Story where we're going to reset. The, I mean, the characters who survive this first season, you will see them again, hopefully, in future seasons. Um, it, so it is an ongoing story, but I wanted every season to be its own sort of case. Uh, I think if you tried to do The Exorcist as a Monster of the Week show, and every week they're doing a different exorcism... It, halfway through the season you would run out of stories to tell and you'd be off Marcus and Tomas would be off investigating the Jersey Devil or UFO sightings or something like that and then you would, it would just turn into another X-Files clone and the world has enough of those um, so so the goal was was let's dive in let's let's tell m make sure this first season has a beginning middle and an end so by the end of the season you will get kind of a definitive answer to the possession of, of Casey Rance and then uh, and then if, if audiences respond, we'll see where we go from there. If, if we're lucky enough to get a second season, I've got a lot of big ideas. Uh, uh, so a lot of Hollywood's uh, exorcism revolves around Christianity. Um, you always see it from Christianity's angle. Uh, in terms of like researching uh, behind the exorcism, do you ever look at like other religions or other uh, cultural groups that deal with exorcism? We do, um, and, and and that's actually something that's going to be explored a lot in the show going forward. Um, not not tomorrow's episode, but episode four, which is a week from tomorrow. Um, you're going to see an exorcism performed by someone who is not a Catholic priest. Um, it, we're we're going to start expanding that world and, and saying, you know, the mythology of our show is that there is a secret war going on. That, that evil has already invaded, they're already among us, they have their own plans, they have their own agenda, and so that's not an evil that's focused on just fighting one religion. It's, 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 fight, it's, it's good versus evil, and so I think as the show goes on, I think that's part of the fun, is, is, is starting to say, what does an exorcism look like if it's performed by a Santeria priest? What does it look like if it's performed by a nun? What does it look like if it's performed by a Buddhist monk? Are, do these different religions have different methods of fighting the same thing? And, and can our heroes kind of draw from those different areas uh, to improve their skills? Um, to me, that's, it, it's, it just gives you the ability to, to tell new sorts of stories. We have time for one more question. Okay, uh, one, the thing that's also appealing to me is it's, it's a little more psychological. It doesn't have to hit you over the head because you have more than two hours to tell a story. Yes. And I like that. And like, I'm not going to be specific, but your version of the original Captain Howdy uh, is can be seen more by the possessed person's uh, viewpoint. Sure. I, I like that aspect of it too. And we can kind of see that. And in the subway, well, I won't give too much, <laughs> but I, I did notice there was a subtle change in his clothing. Oh, it, so, it gets worse. I would think me. so. It gets worse. I think so. Um, yeah, that's part of the fun. Is 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 as you as people saw in the pilot, we definitely have homages to the original film. We have tubular bells. We have that the head spin. There's there's we have the hat. There there's a couple things in there that you would expect to see in a TV show called The Exorcist. But part of the fun moving forward now that now that hopefully we have our own audience who's not tuning in just because of the name they're hopefully tuning in because they now care about the characters or they want to see where the story goes so so part of the fun is is we're now reaching the point in this in in the series where we can start to be our own show we can start to introduce our own wrinkles to the mythology uh, and start to kind of build on on the world of the exorcist instead of sort of just referencing what has come before so that we have a lot of that coming up in 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 tomorrow's episode and and it, it only gets bigger from there